recording. All right, hello and welcome. This is Verz, as always. I'm with Gio. Uh, needs no introduction, but you know we'll give him one anyway. Art critic, um, gallery reviewer, uh, the you know the the quintessential aesthetic critiquer of the uh, distant. Right, I guess. I don't know what you, I don't know what you go by. Uh, well, I guess the the painter equivalent of warrior poet, I guess. <laughs> ah, I like it. Writer, like it. artist, yeah. Very good. There you go. I put my money where my mouth is. I guess you could say. I don't. What's the expression? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> you got skin in the game. That's the expression. Yeah. There you go. Well, that's that's the thing. There there is. I'm. It's like me and a few other people, people I know that are anonymous that are, like doing actual. Um, what would you classify fine art, traditional art? There's very few. I, I'm surprised uh, all of us, we all worship, um, you know, trad paintings that were painted in the 19th century. Uh, <laughs> but yet there's very few of us who are actual artists. Well, I guess besides meme making. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, meme making is a valid art. I think it's like, uh, just like <laughs> photography it was kind of like the uh, modern fusion of like technology and, uh, you know, uh, fine art. I'd I'd say meme memory, meme smithing is a is a nice twenty first century edition. Oh, did I lose you? You're frozen. All right, so we're back. You didn't really see any difference on your end, uh, audience, but uh, there was a little bit of connectivity issues. But uh, anyway, we got Gio. Uh, so uh, Gio, so I'm actually glad that we're doing this because. Uh, all the the chaos that's assuming in, in the world right now, I'm glad <laughs> to not be talking about to yeah. not be talking about that and talking about like aesthetics and art and stuff. Uh, so, but it all uh, feeds back so, uh, into for, it. So who knows, right? It does all feed back into it. It always does. Um, so I feel like I guess since we just to use it as a uh, launch pad, I guess I feel like the uh, um, I've been reading Paglia, right? I mean, mm -hmm, I'm slow mm -hmm. and steady progress, but now. But the more I read Pagula, the more I see, like, you know, the earth cold, uh, sky cold division and how that plays itself out in, like, you know, our culture. And I feel like the mm -hmm. woke culture right now is very, very earth cold. And, you know, the, the return to the tradition types are trying to, you know, move us back in the tradition of, like, a sky cult, which I don't think is – I'm not sure if that's even possible at this point. But I feel like, you know, that, 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 that modern, postmodern rift started to happen. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. now we're kind of like at like an impasse what's your opinion on this yeah oh that's amazing that's great that's totally um a big part of what i'm doing first of all let me just say that i finally mm. got on the versions podcast amazing you're a good yes. friend to me amazing guest i i fastidiously watch uh the versions podcast i recently got done um your video on the death of the self your um single podcast yes. and the alexander bard one but I, I watched all the other ones though like the sunny one mm -hmm. <laughs> sunny hp lovecraft uh yeah so yeah, yeah. it's been it's great that i'm finally uh you know um so yeah yeah but the topic at hand um as you know i recently uh not recently this was like oh god six months ago uh huge 70 page gallery review of uh the abortion is normal emergency gallery by uh, the titans mm -hmm. of the feminist art world, um, and I go I go into this, mm -hmm. um, and it's at Rocket Reviews by uh, our good friend Seneca Reads, uh, published there. But I, I find it interesting. I'll link that in the description. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess to not so much talk about that, but to talk about the the main driving force, it seems that um, the th the thing about postmodernism is that, well, there's the debate whether we actually are modern. Because I, I think in some ways, mm -hmm. if we were to approach, you know, a lot of what I, the traditions that I come from and people that we know online come from, uh, which is, you know, Jungian, uh, Joseph Campbell, archetypal, depth psychology, things like that, it seems that there's a renaissance of this content, you know. And I, I knew about all this stuff, you know, way before mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson and all of that. But it, it seems that, to approach the world of tradition with the world of the postmodern. There's debate whether there's truly a postmodernism itself or whether we live in a form of hypermodernity. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the way that you can approach this within a postmodern framework is to not so much focus on 
there's this relationship between the 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 archetypal realm of, for example, the fertility cult, the uh, the um, mm-hmm. Mother Sophia, as opposed to the crone, which is representative of the, the the old hag or the consuming mother. Because let me be clear, what we're experiencing now is a rebirth or a um, slipping in of the back door, not so much of a fertility cult almost like an anti-fertility cult of what Paglia calls the Chthonic forces, Mm -hmm. the mother that eats the old hag mother that eats uh, her festering rotted away children. Um, And so this is indicative of the, the worship of the feminine that we're seeing now, but the way to bring this into the postmodern reality, a very helpful metric would be, what John David Ebert in his book, Art After Metaphysics, he distinguished, which is a very uh, driving book in, in my research, he distinguishes between the archetype and the iconotype. Mm-hmm. The iconotype is rooted within the local, within the tangential, within the, the experiential of a particular epoch and an era. What we're seeing now is a rebirth of an iconotype that is perfectly suited for the death of the meta narrative within postmodernism. So, The reason that we're seeing archetypal content bubbling up is we're seeing a resurgence of this content through the lens of a site-specific, contextually-specific, discourse-specific iconotype of the consuming mother or the terrible mother that Neumann calls uh, in his book, um, Art in the Collective Unconscious. So this is what people get hung up on. It's not so much a rebirth of people like Young and Joseph Campbell talk about with the mother is this presence throughout the throughout human history that is the bringer of life but also the destroyer of life as well. We're not seeing a whole picture. We're seeing a very distorted hyper political version of an iconotype that is from the collective. So we're seeing a very butchered, mutilated, uh skinned of essence version of the great mother itself. And you see this in, in mm-hmm. the, the biggest and smallest example. So from these protests, uh, you know, baby witches, uh, you know, woke activism, mm-hmm. uh, worshipping these local forms of pagan and um, what would you say? Uh, pagan and semi-quasi-religious expressions that are only rooted within a sort of identity politics that has been stripped of its original context. And of course, this is the nature Mm -hmm. of of postmodernism and neoliberalism, because it seems that the great monolithic traditions, whether it be Christianity, um, uh, Buddhism to an extent, but Buddhism is a very complicated one because Buddhism in some ways is the quintessential religion of modernity. This is what Zizek talks about. Um, But it's a form of, like again, a neutered, globalized, mutated version of Buddhism, not the original uh, traditions, whether it be Theravata mm. or Vajrayana or, or Zen or whatnot. It seems that Zen Buddhism is the one that got exported for various reasons the most to the West, and that's been the one that's been so uh, thoroughly abused and stripped of its essence. Well, lack of that. I mean, essence is a complicated well, it has that, like, flat. It has that flat, like, um, quality to it that is kind yeah. of appealing to people in like modernity now, especially you know, given our secular Protestantism and stuff, it is the most compatible. So exactly, that, that, it makes sense that that's the one that kind of ended up here. And it, it makes sense in a variety of ways because it it rather than it's it's a very fine alchemy that a lot of these discourses that have developed in terms of taking the original inspiration for things like Zen Buddhism and turning it into this you know, mindfulness, corporatized, neoliberal monster that it is nowadays where people have seminars on transcendental, mm. like, you you know, being in New York, these circles, right? Like, they have seminars on transcendental meditation and so yeah. forth, California Buddhism. It, it's very funny because it's almost like they had to find a way to slip in um, the lessons of things like rusticity and simplicity and the... Um, furthering away of one's uh because self is a complicated word but the further one gets from materiality and possession in in terms of always Mm -hmm. wanting desire and furthering desire it seems that they had to find a way to slip that into a very 
um, alienating, life-denying version of it as opposed to a life-affirming version. So, for example, if you look at um, the rebirth of minimalism and, uh, pa, you know, I'm not going to eat the pot, I'm not going to eat the bugs, all that stuff, it seems that they had to sort of weaponize mm -hmm. a lot of lessons of Buddhism against the very people who live um, by any definition, uh, urbanite, bourgeois, upper-class existences. So it's really funny, and I think in the art world you have this as well. Of course, we're going to get into this. But to answer your question, um, mm -hmm. we're seeing a rebirth of a lot of these quasi-spiritual forces because it seems that since, I would say, 2007 onwards, the whole like obsession with secularism and new atheism on the political left and even the political right um, it seems that mm -hmm. that wasn't working. That wasn't the, the main thrust of anything because really these are very nihilistic, self-defeating. I know like, you know, cause back in the day when mm -hmm. I was a kid, not a kid, but I was like a teenager. I got all hung up on teenager, this stuff. Yeah. 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 I got all hung up. Yeah, on we all did. Stuff. I can't, I, I, I look, it was cringe, but I, I, like I said to someone on the internet yeah. recently, all these zoomers like to be like, Oh, you millennials. Are look, listen, if we didn't do the cringe for you, you would still be dealing yeah, exactly. with the cringe. Okay. We had to go so through you the, don't the have rationalist, to. less wrong. So, and all that new atheism Reddit stuff. So that yeah. you don't have to do it. All right. So I, that well, was I, our sacrifice <laughs> to you. Well, I was the opposite. But, um, I, I, but actually, I, well, before we move on, the Zen Buddhism thing ahead. I think is important. I think it's like Victorianism where like they want to push this whole denial of materiality so that it kind of yes. creates a taboo, which makes it more appealing. So it gives it like a mm -hmm. sexy energy because, you know, consumption and like our, you know, capitalist society, it's already kind of passe and bland. So adding this layer of like, oh, let's eschew materiality. Well, gives yeah. it a, a sexiness that makes it more desirable. But anyway, what were you well, about to say? No, what I was going to say that I wasn't exactly um, a new atheist. That was more in the like, because um, when I was a kid, I had very bad experiences with these people. I, I remember um, being on YouTube and I, I got this nasty comment from TJ Kirk himself from The Amazing Atheist. And so I, I always struggled with these like creationism stuff. And, uh, but the problem was the, the discourse was so entirely limiting. And then of course I discovered a lot of other things like Francis Collins book. And then, then I sort you know, I, I was a new ager for a long time, put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. before I rediscovered my Catholicism. Uh, but yeah, but it's a good point. You mentioned that because it's, it's almost like when you were talking with Alexander Bard, when he said something very fascinating and interesting about the nature of late capitalism almost in, in something that Marx couldn't have predicted moving past commodification um, of the brute product itself, because no longer can mm -hmm. advertising work within the digital sphere. He was saying now it's the attention mm -hmm. economy and it's, it's like you have to become a brand unto itself. So for example, mm -hmm. this, this is a great example. I am, um, I was watching, I, I forget which show because my mother she she ropes me into these stupid TLC shows like 90 Day Fiance and uh, these 90, yeah that's a that's a hit right now <laughs> yeah yeah um, <laughs> shout out to June <laughs> um, she we were watching and I remember these commercials because it, it was fascinating to me because 90 Day Fiance almost disproves the the um, globalization and the positive multiculturalism that companies like THC are pushing networks because of various reasons. But I watched this commercial. It was about um, Black Lives Matter and protesting and how you know Zoomers are going to change the world because us millennials we're we're dead we're gone they're writing Senate. They have about Black it. Lives Matter commercials. Yes, but guess what? They have what? BLM commercials. Guess what? It was a oh Black my god! Lives Matter I didn't know this. I don't have television. Yeah, go oh, good, good, good. Um, but get this. Oh god. I didn't discover until the end of the commercial that it was an old navy commercial. They didn't they, they totally kayfabe it till the end that it was a old navy commercial. Oh, my so god. it wasn't about selling jeans, it wasn't about selling clothes, it was purely about the messaging. And I think that's because people don't care about advertising anymore. So they have to become, mm -hmm. um, it's even beyond lifestyle brands. It's a hyper-political version of lifestyle brands. So now it's not, um, I'm going to buy Old Navy because I'm hip and I'm sexy and I'm like young. No, it's like you buy Old Navy because you have the virtue signal, right? And, and, and this is the problem, I think, with a lot of mm -hmm. online discourse about um, 
especially normie conservatives, when they talk about uh, the quantification of identity politics, when they say things like, well, it's mm-hmm. because they want to make money and it's like, go get woke or broke. Like, that's not true. That's simply not true. It's it, There's a, a variety of complex forces that are involved in why companies are doing this. Is it to make money? Yes, of course, like everything else. But it's because advertising does not have the same pull because people realize that this sort of shameless uh, marketing of commodities is something that's fundamentally alienating to the human subject. And because we have, um, we're almost entering, I would say, a post-secular age in terms of people embracing highly Mm -hmm. politicized, highly localized, um, highly, what would you say, neutered versions of um, Mm -hmm. witchcraft and mysticism and Buddhism and and, and, uh, fertility cults and things like that. Uh, because we have that, companies, uh, commodity capitalism realizes that we we are we're quote unquote woke to the commodification of all life. Now we have to embrace it by other means, and this is by the attention economy. Mm-hmm. This is by um, brands becoming uh, antigens of social change themselves, and and this all ties mm-hmm. into the hyper aestheticization of a lot of these forces. Because I truly believe that. Like like Baudrillard said, um, that he said, you know, it's not that we have a lack of meaning, it's that we have too much meaning, meaning we have bullshit, you know, pseudo-event meanings. Yeah. I think that it's not that we have, we have bad aesthetics, we have terrible art, we have good art as well, but it's that we have a suffocation of the aesthetic, we have a glut of it, so people do not realize what is being uh, generated out of a, you know, spirit of true authentic expression or because it's to sell you shit or it's because to sell you a political message. And it seems that it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. And this is a problem with the democratization of art itself. Now me, myself, I, I wouldn't say that I am a, in terms of just raw technical skill, I'm not the greatest artist out there, obviously like my friends are way better than me. Um, but I, I think like, you know, when I'm self-taught and all of that, but the the difference I think is that when you truly try to craft um, works of art that are meaningful, that are meaningful towards you, but also to other people. Now, you know, I, I've, I've done my share bit of like shameless meme art myself, you know, because, Hey, we all got to you know mm-hmm. try to spell. Right. Um, but the difference I think is that a lot of art that's produced nowadays. And I, I don't just mean like, of course I'm coming from the fine art world, but I mean, you know, anything from video mm-hmm. games to music to everything. It seems that music nowadays especially has always been the, uh, at least in modernity, has been the driving force. And it's not so much that visual art yeah. is th- at the capstone anymore. Because I think visual art went through a lot of transformations that have been, you know, become very alienating to quote-unquote normies. So the problem, I think, is that there's, you know... I was talking about this the other day to a follower of mine. He, he, uh, I retweeted it. If you go to my timeline, um, um, yak, he, he, uh, responded to this tweet that blew up by this artist. I wouldn't even call him a musician artist, but it's this like really scrawny guy with the glasses, with the keyboard. He does this like really terrible noise stuff where it's just like him tapping on the keyboard and he's saying racism's bad. Racism sucks. Fuck racist. And it's like, got mm-hmm. you know a hundred thousand retweets or likes or whatever it, it seems that that's like the perfect distillation of what um what the modern i would say like postmodern hyper political activist art has become just right now before we were entering the video chat um i believe it was same that linked he was making some comment it was this asian girl who's a only fans person and she did this thing where it's 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 very I don't know why they do this, but it's a very common theme where they put words on the body because I guess if you take the the uh, you know critical theory Foucauldian uh, interpretation, it's inscribing words upon the body, and it's basically her gluing to herself um, different texts that she received through OnlyFans of men who were like sexualizing her Asian identity by saying like you're a hot little Asian. Um, your you know G word stuff like that, and, and I this of I course is uh, this is, this of course is clearly not to be expected as you're <laughs> you prosting, but whatever, continue. Yeah, I know, but 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 see, but this is the thing, and this is I was going to write this thread, 
but I might as well talk about it here. Um, not only are you opening yourself up to this um, commodification, but not only that, a racialization, because as we know, um, prostitute, I mean, if you could label OnlyFans prostitution, it lacks the, um, it's I would say. It's definitely. It, it, it is prostitution, but it's it's a, um, again, like all things, this is what I'm saying. And Virtual. people have, obs- you know, people have observed this. Our friends have observed this on Twitter about how there's no longer that verve and that essence of subversion and of the underground and of grit mm-hmm. and disgust, but also a, a strange sort of beauty that comes out of the, the seediest parts of humanity. Now it's just this commodified sex work. It's, it's no longer that eroticism mm-hmm. of the degenerative that Paglia talks about. And I, I forget who tweeted. I think it was, um, it was either Lo-Fi Republican or Benedemilich. But I, I think it was a little Republican. But it, and Paglia has a lot of similar. You, you're recently reading Paglia. Throughout all of her work, she talks mm-hmm. about this that the the seedy eroticism of things like prostitution is totally it's obliterated now that it's become like acceptable and commodified through OnlyFans and through sex, quote unquote, sex work and cam whoring. But it, to me, it's funny mm-hmm. because you, as an Asian woman, you're opening yourself up to the erotic possibilities of racialization, which I think, you know, is kind of mm-hmm. is bad and all of that. Like uh, morally, I think is disgusting. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to say like, I mean, it's a funny meme and all that stuff, but it's, you know, it, it must be offensive that, you know, horny dudes are texting you. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think so. Yes. Like, but also pepper. like fundamentally, this is like, this is one of my like uh, most controversial opinions, but, as a you know oh, minority, I could say it. I think that like, no, but really, I think that like. <laughs> well, I guess I'm a minority. I'm Italian, so who knows? I'm kind of like. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, I mean, you're already well, commodifying you yourself when you're doing like OnlyFans. Yeah, so you're already commodifying yeah. yourself, right? So now, if you consider yourself a commodity in that in that sense, you're already kind of a you know being. Uh, attributed to like market forces right so like just like i would choose between one cereal or another based off like branding and like whether they have the marshmallows i like or whatever similarly i would choose between one e e thought and another one based off like oh is this this race is it this whatever how tall is she blah blah blah. like these 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 uh object qualities are what makes the difference between you know uh products it's like uh i um, i forgot what they call it uh come up something monopoly i can't i can't remember my e-com terms but you can't expect to like be treated as like a holistic subject if you're no no turning yourself into a commodity it's like it's to be expected and furthermore in all dating this exists and Mm -hmm. you kind of just have to take what qualities you have to your advantage some people like vanilla some people like chocolate like it'd be like that sometimes i don't know that's just me though people don't like that opinion right now but no, but it's Whatever. it's totally true. That I think this is what I was going to say too, is that you are opening yourself up to a commodification of who you are because the problem with a lot of this is that you are, you are being treated based upon the environment that you are active in in terms of what your commodification is. So on OnlyFans mm-hmm. or e-prostitution or so forth, you know that right off the bat, the visual stimuli of you being an Asian woman is going to play into your quote unquote marketable ability. Now these are very disgusting and dehumanizing terms, mm-hmm. obviously, but it's the it's the um, the environment that one exists and operates in. Now I think the problem is that she's trying to turn it into almost like this protest art of like, oh my god, it's so terrible that guys that paid for my nudes are calling me a uh, you know I don't want to say it, but you know what I mean, like calling me offensive names because I'm Asian mm-hmm. and saying stuff like uh can you play up the asianness can you be like a little my little china doll it's you know what i mean it's it to me it seems that mm. yeah, I, yeah. I don't know why I, I hate to stereotype but it seems that white women tend to do this like it's very grammable uh to write words on the body itself and i think this is a huge huge problem mm-hmm. with the contemporary art world in general is that it's it's always this lens of and I find this interesting, obviously, like I'm not totally deriding it because I think this is the difference between a lot of, you know, me and you and a lot of E-trads is that we find this intellectually stimulating, but at the same time, uh, deeply, deeply flawed. Meaning that, like, I understand the message of trying to mm-hmm. ascribe discourse upon the body, trying to ascribe racialization 
but it's the problem is that this is very North American. You know, this is very um, white girlish. Mm -hmm. This is very grammable. I think that's the the good word for it. Because now the yeah. pro, the act of protest of you consenting to be sexualized and being racialized through that sexualization, now you're trying to make this into an act of protest through an aesthetic of inscribing this racialized discourse upon the body itself. Because when we're left without, mm -hmm. when we're in the absence of the sacred, I love using that term because it's a Lamb of God song, but whatever. Um, sacred, for yeah. Yeah, yeah, off of New American Gospel. Um, but when we're in the absence yeah. of the sacred, all we are left is with the somatic, with the cathectic, with the body itself. And this is a problem because, but here's the difference. The difference, I think, is to not reject the body. Because there's a lot of artists out there that are doing interesting work. For example, my, my good friend, Joan Pope, who I highly recommend sh you should interview. Um, she, she uh, go to her Twitter, Sex, Death, Rebirth. Go to her Instagram. She is a brilliant beautiful visual artist who uses her own body similar to Anna Mendieta another very fam famous artist that I wrote about but maybe I'll send you the link um, she mm -hmm. uses the body to, to glorify and, and to resacralize the feminine body itself and this is why I think her art is very important and vital and even though people you know a lot of the trads they freak out when i when i retweet her because it's like oh my god it's a naked woman but it's it's like but the point being is that she's using her own nakedness and and you know she's a very appealing body by the way but she's using that to um heighten a a sense of a sacredness that can come about through the same mediums that a lot of these, you know, Instagram influencers use. And I think that's brilliant. That's great. She uses a lot of um, edits and, and photo editing and, and video. And she's also a musician. Mm -hmm. she, she's a DJ. Um, so I think the problem is that when we're left with the body itself, um, it's no longer that sort of sacred comportment that existed throughout, for example, the Baroque and Renaissance painting and, and so forth, where the body was viewed as a, especially the feminine body was viewed as a conduit towards the divine. Rather, the body itself is, is merely mm -hmm. brought down into the earth, but into a hyper-modernity that has politicized all life itself. And now the body itself, even in the act of sex work, even though I hate that term, becomes this conduit of politics and of a aestheticization of mm -hmm. one's own commodification. And people think, and these women think it's liberation. It's not liberation. It's a false mm -hmm. liberation that welds you towards the forces of capitalist realism itself. I'm sorry, I'm going off mm -hmm. right now, but... No, no you're, no, you're right. And like, I, I like to also pr yeah. point out... I like to also point out that just like um, I said this before in like that in that like solo thing, but I think that the part of the reason why they're trying to commodify and like comment on like the racialization and like their objectivity and blah, blah, is to like highlight is like the it creates a concreteness to their identities in yes. the in the world where their identity is being removed, like the 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 the, the sacredness of identity itself is being removed right we're moving into oh, yeah. like a post-industrial society the internet is like fracturing our identities etc and because it, the, this deep sense of individualism is lost we they need a way to like ground it and by sexualizing your femininity or sexualizing your asianness in respect to your femininity creating these movements based around some these nuances of gender that blah 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 mm -hmm. this creates it fixes it this creates a like a, a concretization of identity so they can feel at least on some level that it's real just like your yeah. jihadists would just like neat like you know death of god or like a jihadist doesn't if you ever they do polls they don't aren't actually as religious as you would think they are and it's no, the no. act of jihad is to reinforce the 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 felt death of the god that they believe in similarly yeah, well, it's i like think the this two is to reinforce yeah, it's like the two bombers um, went know. to see prostitutes and all of that. I think that's uh, – mm -hmm. but it's it's funny because a lot of um, – and, and this shocks people, obviously. But I think, like, it's a good thing we're over the Muslim thing, I, I feel. Like, that was a huge, huge mistake for the political mm -hmm. right in, in, in North America, but also in Europe in particular. I think that in Europe it's a bit different because they're dealing with mass migration and they're dealing with – but even still yeah. – they're actually, like, near – 
Muslim countries, like in, yeah, exactly. in, in large degree. So there's, there's a little more of a real reality there. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. If, like for example, um, a, a lot of my family that still lives in Calabria, like right up, right across is, um, you know, Ethiopia and, 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 you know, um, uh, North, a mm-hmm. North Africa. Right. So, um, the, the problem I, in Europe, it's a bit different, but even still, it seems that the Muslim population, they're, they're, they're getting just as rootless and neoliberal as anyone else. It seems that, um, you know, mm-hmm. the one sort of prediction that the new atheists, the, the absolute only thing that they were right about was that eventually the forces of global, you know, global liberalism was going to, uh, eventually de-radicalize Muslims, but who knows? I mean, it's, it's up in the air because as mm-hmm. you said, um, a lot of this activity is to re-substantiate that lost form of sacredness. In that way, terrorism is almost like a, a ghost dance in some ways. It's a way of getting back mm-hmm. at McWorld. You know, again, Benjamin Barber, you know, Jihad versus McWorld. I think it's different nowadays because now it's almost as if McWorld is colonizing the world of Jihad and no longer is that the greater jihad is there. It needs to be, and this is what people, you know, various perennialists talk about as well in the Muslim world, that there needs to be a rebirth of the greater jihad, which is the inner jihad. But it's very complicated and it's very difficult because of the forces of modernity, because of globalization. But but to get to your point about this this OnlyFans, um, it's, it's, it's a way of um, pinning down your identity but in a way that's um, not going to be threatening to various economic, uh, socio-political power structures. So by you affirming your identity mm-hmm. of the intersection of Asianness and femininity, and you are a woman, you're an Asian woman on OnlyFans, it, it's a way of producing very cheap and easy um, aesthetic uh, sociological discourses there. But the problem is that, mm-hmm. you know... A lot of Asian people, I, I think, are just in the same boat in the West as, you know, white people in terms of not having a solid identity or being disconnected or you sh- or even like, the, you know, the black population in America, you could say is like this as well. Um, very um, detached from the or- originary, uh, not just identities, but the sort of uh, felt ethnos of their own people, right? So... Mm-hmm. Um, what happens is they end up taking up discourses that are sort of alien to this. And this is when, you know, I I could think of an example would be in the seventies with the post-colonial movements. A lot of them were led by Western educated, European educated um, leaders that learned about, you know, existentialism and Marxism and so forth. Like for example, Franz Fanon was a student of Mm. Jean Bonsart and so forth. Uh, And so what happens is, um, you have a a very like like I say you know, white girl form of aesthetics of putting words in your body and things of that nature and putting it on Instagram, but really uh, the whole concept of nudity or aesthetic nudity itself it was totally absent in Asia up until the 18th century up until the West sort of came and colonized the, the Asian continent because before that you had concepts uh, like the impossible nude where nudity wasn't really present in art because they had a totally different um, purpose of art. They didn't even have a concept of the aesthetic as such that we have in terms of, um, you could say, the beauteous, right? They had a totally different way of approaching art itself as being embedded within spiritual practices. And so, therefore, a lot of paintings of the feminine form in Asia, in Japan and China, they didn't. They weren't fully nude. It was always the coming into presence of nudity itself. They always had an article of clothing. Some of them looked very um, elongated and alien-like. Um, in China, you had, you know, of course, the watercolor paintings, uh, the ink paintings. And in Japan, you had um, the 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 ukiyo woodblock woodblock prints. They they didn't have the same approach to the full presence of the human body like we did in the West with, with uh, you know, various art movements from the Baroque and onward. They had a totally different understanding of the body as something that is coming into presence, something that is um, fundamentally involved in an, an effort of concealment. It's almost, it's very Taoistic in a way, right? And of course I use concealment presencing as like the Heideggerian um, 
terminology, but it seems that it's again to to say that the the twofold act of commodifying the, the feminine Asian subject through the OnlyFans to these men that are texting her this and the, the simultaneous mm -hmm. act of using it as a form of protest and affirming your your embodiment as Asian as a woman, it seems that that both lends into a superstructure of commodification and of the politicization mm -hmm. of the aesthetic body itself. So no longer is um, the body made into a work of art that has a sort of concealment that has an ability to come into a an infinite amount of possibilities. Now it's a very hammered down wedded form of the aesthetic body that is being inscribed physically with words, with discourse, with language into itself. Mm -hmm. So no longer is the body something that is mysterious and um, ever flowing with um, novelty. Now the body is something that is mm -hmm. very um, wedded to particular cultural political discourses within uh, within w the, the hyper modernity that we're seeing now. I hope that makes sense. You know, this is what I'm trying to. Yeah. No, it does make sense. Uh, no, yeah, it definitely does make sense. It, uh, it, uh, I mean, it commodifies. It takes, it takes what was, uh, it takes discretion in like a, a ephemeral way, and it turns it into like a discrete object, which you know, pun mm -hmm. intended there. Like it, ta it takes, it like concretizes. It puts everything in a box. It, it adds to the commodification of just self, and it's, it's, it's. But it's funny that it's done in a way that the people are deluding themselves into thinking that it's some greater cause. And this is so. Here's the, the other thing I wanted to mention. There's a. So Schopenhauer has this great essay on women that is like the most misogynistic essay that is also also the most <laughs> brilliant essay at the same time. And every yes, time yes, I see yes. another one of these moments of like girls writing whatever on their body or another art piece that's effectively just another vagina in another new creative way of making <laughs> yeah. a vagina. I'm like, you know, for one of the most misogynistic pieces of thing I've ever read, it's also one of the most... Uh, poignant <laughs> critiques of like uh, you know female art where it's just like he I, I mean I can't give direct quotes because I can't think of it off the top of my head but like essentially he kind of was like the female artist cannot remove cannot create a subject object distinction typically and they typically mm -hmm. uh, imbue their ob their subjectivity in the object and it's often like and it, it doesn't you can't they don't capture things in and of themselves it's always some means of like of like you know incorporating their their subjecthood in the object um, yeah because because they view themselves also as objects and it and it's it's interesting that like again every single time i see a, a, a artwork especially in 21st century every girl's an artist now every girl is like, yeah every girl's a, yeah exactly the, yeah and it's always the same thing of just like yeah it's their their subjectivity is in in you know involved even like i i have a friend who's went to parsons award-winning female artist great painter wow. and even wow. she is doing the same thing and it's done at a really high technical level but oh, yeah. it is still her uh, subjectivity as object in a painting form and so it's, it's it's just really interesting how you know sometimes you know th things like misogyny or lindy i don't know i don't know if you want to tell, i don't <laughs> well, know uh, yeah, really send, anything send else me her that. work Send me her work and maybe oh, you can yeah. send her my work as well. Um, but I, I think, it, but here's the thing. Here's a nuclear controversial take, all right? Now. Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Because I'm going to offend the manosphere and I'm going to offend, uh, you know, female artists. Uh, I think that that's not inherently a bad thing. And I don't think Schopenhauer thought it was a bad thing. Because the, the difference, I mm -hmm. think, is that women... Um, they, they're they subject to the forces of nature and of the spirit itself. And they, therefore, they their, their sense of self is always outwardly directed towards not just the other, but to the, the grand other, the even the absence of the other within the sacred. So I think the reason that a lot of female art throughout human history has been driven by um, their own self-expression through themselves, whether it's Georgia O'Keeffe, whether it's Anna Mendieta, even before with a lot of female artists like um, like like, uh, like Saint Hildegard, for example, a lot of this art is very self-word and inwardly directed within the female uh, sense of subjectivity. 
is because they are so subject to a lot mm -hmm. of these um, impersonal forces that men can sort of separate themselves from. And in a way, it's almost like um, a, a male artist has to find themselves differently through putting their own um, their own artistic expression, their own comportment and sense of ontological grounding in the other, in the concept, in the higher. And, and they, it's a very, it's a struggle and it's a slog and you have to really find yourself. But a lot of mm -hmm. female artists, they come ready equipped with this inwardly directed uh, form of self-expression. And therefore a lot of this mm -hmm. art can produce something that is great and beautiful but it's very unique as opposed to a lot of Western art or even Eastern art throughout history. So a lot of this is just, um, but the problem is that when you have a society that is, uh, because, you know, women are more social creatures. The problem is that when you mm -hmm. have society that is using them as political weapons, therefore their own form mm -hmm. of self-expression through art becomes this um, celebration of, of, uh, this very like in your face gaudy form of activist art and also a mm -hmm. you know but people think it's ugly and all i think ugliness has a place obviously but it becomes a celebration of the uh de-aestheticization and paglia talks about this as well so therefore beauty is no longer the main um conveyor of, of female subjectivity within the work of art rather it is the destruction of beauty itself because beauty has become problematized it's become you know quote-unquote fascistic it's become something that is a um detriment to quote-unquote female liberation and so i think that the, the the way that the manosphere gets it wrong is that it's not that it's inherently a bad thing that women have these certain characteristics or female artists have these certain characteristics i think it's just the order of things and and that we should um cultivate social and, and even spiritual conditions that can um strengthen the relations between uh the men and women and strengthen uh female self-expression that is towards more um what would you say virtuous and godly ends because nowadays but, mm. but yet at the same time i think that schopenhauer's analysis is ultimately correct and even though it's like you know terribly misogynistic mm. and and uh you know <laughs> and here's he's the right thing though. here's the thing <laughs> he's right you you just have to read that essay you don't have to spend um a huge amount of time reading manosphere blogs i mean maybe you could go to chateau uh heritage or whatever i mean honestly that essay but, does all the manosphere blogs in like you know one exactly. page it, 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 exactly. it, it's all there it's it's all there but, uh, and you don't have to have this resentment about it either and that's again another big problem like having spent a lot of time you know years ago in the manosphere and and sort of coming out of it i think that the problem is that um at the same time i think some criticisms of the manosphere by a, a lot of, uh, you know, what would you call it, woke discourses or whatnot. A lot of them, unfortunately, I think are sort of correct in that there tends to be a lot of um, incelish resentment that, that I even struggle with myself, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's it's just that the problem... We all do. Get, it's part, it's part we all do, man, exactly. And, and the thing is, you have to... It's, it's a way of self-overcoming to realize that, you know, women are a certain way, men will inevitably be a certain way. And, and it just, it, it, it becomes complicated because of the various, you know, forces and atomization and, and, and uh, death of community and religion and modernity. It becomes even more complicated. But I noticed the problem is that, you know, the analysis may be correct that, you know, uh, you know, hypergamy and all this stuff. But the problem is that what you do with it afterwards, because it, it, it mm. seems a lot of Manosphere people by their own writings, a lot of them, they, they are incapable of viewing, uh, and again, controversial take, a lot of them are incapable of viewing the female subject as a subject. And so they have a lot of like funny ideas and no longer... Um, it's, it's a counter discourse to the predominant discourse that, you know, we do live in a gynocracy. We live in a very female led mm -hmm. um, social state and our ontology itself is very feminine, right? Our assumptions about mm -hmm. pedagogy and education, as you know, 
being in the education world, very yeah, feminine. Very feminine. So, but the difference is, I think the problem is that the, the counter discourse by the manosphere is severely fucked up because they didn't have a way of reconciling this with a masculine subject that can self overcome these conditions. The problem is that they entirely mm -hmm. said, okay, if you're going to, you know, quote unquote, other eyes and, and, um, desubjectify the male subject and, and ridicule and rob us of our sense of self then it's like we're going to do that to you 10 times over, right? And it becomes this this war game, if you will. And and the problem is that you have a lot of young men who um, develop very sort of different neuroses. And, and I think to tie this to the main subject of our talk, I truly believe that transcendental art can ameliorate a lot of these problems, in my opinion. I think that the, if you focus on the aesthetic intersecting with the spiritual, intersecting with a culture that is unique and vibrant and genuine. I think a lot of this shit is going to sort of disappear if you cultivate this aesthetic and spiritual sensibility. And, and you know, I, I know that it's a meme and all of that, but I, I noticed that, you know, the Kaliak movement on Twitter, I think there's some promising aspects of it in terms of, you know, any sort of culture or political movement, I hate to break it to you guys, but any movement, you're going to have to attract women eventually. And I think that good yeah, art, sure. you know, good, in order to survive, and I think that good aesthetics and good art and, and a spiritual foundation that is grounded within something that is authentic and, and not something that is a fad or something that is just purely an aesthetic, I think that is something that can deliver both men and women to, to whatever, you know, glorious trad future that you imagine. And this is the problem. And, and the way you're going to do it isn't you're going to um, totally reject the tools that modernity and post-modernity has given you. You're going to have to embrace aspects of things like um, abstraction and critique and, and so forth. But I noticed the problem is that a lot of these online right-wing movements, they, they have a they have a, a, an impersonal aesthetic sense and they have a cultivation of a certain look, but they don't have a lot of people mm. that are creating something that is fundamentally artistic and affirming. So for example, we all know the, the, mm -hmm. the you know, terror wave and prim aesthetic. We all know the graph Twitter um, sensibility, yeah. but are there graph Twitter artists? No, or maybe a few, but are, are there, um, even in accelerations, and I think that, you know, the divide between the romanticism of primitivism and, and uh, ecological awareness and, and, you know, even, you know, back in the thermometer days, we called it doomsday optimism, right? The, the collapse mm. craft Twitter people. I think that they're losing out in some respects to the accelerationists because the accelerationists already have an inborn form of digital aesthetics that can be mm -hmm. further cultivated, right? Of course, I don't think there's... There's some artists that are being inspired by people like Nick Land, but I think the problem is that, you know, they have somewhat of an edge, but it's still not fully realized. When it comes to new reaction, I think it's hopeless because a lot of... I, I hate to say it, new reaction is, is a purely intellectual movement, and they, they don't really... They never really cultivated any sort of um, artistic sensibility besides LARPing you know, uh, trad paintings that were painted in the 19th century, you said mm -hmm. before, right? So the, I think this is the big problem is that we know on an intuitive level more than anyone else because, uh, you know, when it comes to a lot of um, our quote-unquote enemies, they, they may have the art world, they may have the Hollywood culture industry, but we all know that that stuff is like an incredibly alienating to people, especially the culture industry. The problem is that these people that we interact with, the people that are in our spheres, we should know better. We, we should know that we have to go out there and create. But the problem is that mm -hmm. it just seems we're too caught up in critique and analysis, which is good. I mean, I do it myself, obviously. Um, but mm -hmm. the problem is that there's, there's nothing more than just critique. And, and there's nothing more than just recognizing the absolute um, inner... Uh, mental hell horrors of the modern world and 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 there's nothing that can be offered to people but i i see some inklings here and there with some of these zoomers that there, there may be lights of hope 
if, if they really focus on cultivating um, greatness through the work of art, I think that it can be done. And this can even be done digitally. There's some people that are doing digital art, even though I myself, I shy away from it. I, I, I believe that when you're doing traditional art, that digital using digital tools can be somewhat of a crutch in some respects. But if you're doing mm-hmm. it, like I know people that incorporate um, both the digital and the sort of tactile traditional art forms, and they do it well. But uh, the problem is that we need to go further in this. We need to sort of, uh, in one respect, we need to, you know, yes, it's good to create alternative institutions. In my opinion, I think alternative forms of patronage is the biggest problem, in my opinion. Money is always going to be, funding, you know, is always going to be the biggest problem. And and all of the institutions that are on the political right, that are like normie conservative stuff, like think tanks and, and Fox oh, News people, people, those people are going to die. Getting picked up. Yeah, they're 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 going to die. They're going to go away, and and they they produce nothing mm. of value because it, it you know if if someone like I don't know who's the biggest funder that the the family that gives people on Fox News a lot of money. What what are their names? Coke, um, the, the Coke brothers. Well, yeah, the Coke, yeah, the Coke brothers. They they're sort of out of the picture now. They they've you know gone the anti-Trump way. But yeah, you know the Sheldon Nielsen's of the world. If they really want mm. banks for their bucks, then then you know. Fund people like us. Give us money. Don't give Charlie Kirk money. Mm-hmm. But but yes, yeah, more and more. Yeah, but even the grifters on the top. That, yeah, the the problem is that a lot of grifters at the top that want to achieve that level of of uh, you know, conservative boomer grifting, they too they're kind of useless. And I'm not going to name names, but you know, it, it it just seems that there's always going to be a a limited amount of reach when you're in these you know, niche intellectual spheres. And and the mm-hmm. problem is that when you start to get into the reality that, you know, we exist within cults of personalities built upon other cults of personalities and that there's always going to be a continuous war on the internet between like, you know, between tribes, that, like there's no coherent unifying ethos there. And, and this plays into, I think, the lack of good art within a lot of these, you know, online spheres is that it's the same sort of sickness. Like, we're, you know, at the end of the day, I know people give people, you know, a lot of heat, like, um, like Logo, for example, but he's kind of mm-hmm. he right, though. He, that wrote a, just, he wrote a book. Yeah, yeah, he wrote a book. But no, but what I mean is, yeah, selfie suicide, but go by selfie suicide. Um mm-hmm. Uh, but what I mean is, like, his takes about how we're just as much the subject of, of the modern world as anyone else. I think that's correct. I think that, you know... Of course, yeah. Like, LARPing can only get you so far, you know what I mean? I think that you have to recognize that we're we're given the, the place in the world and the tools that we're given, and that we really have to be honest with ourselves in, in how we're approaching these things. Because there's a lot of mind parasites and mind traps that we are subjugating ourselves to that we're falling in all the time. And that even the language of um, the us versus them is something that is ever present, but something that has to be dealt with more seriously because there's always going to be the friend enemy distinction. But I, I truly believe that there's some things that are starting to affect the outside world than you know, just our spheres. For example, I think that we have to take the lessons of fa- other failed movements, such as the alternative right, because they did have an impact on the outside world than their own circles, but it was a bad impact. It was terrible. We, they fucked up. We all know mm. this. But yet nowadays we have to sort of move on from that. We have to take those lessons. For example, recently with Bronze Age Pervert, you know, the Minnesota congressman mm. I, some stuff like that i i think that it, it's good in a way i mean it's terribly it's you know it's bad because people don't understand people just call you a nazi racist evil all no, that i think stuff. He, he he just talked about this on this podcast he thinks yeah. it's kind of uh it's yeah. one of those like soros things it is it like, is they took yeah but but i think his point being is that when he said that it's not going to affect him or affect the Baptists if mm. they're you know coherent force, it's not going to affect them the same way that it's going to affect that it affected the alt right being exposed to the sunlight. Because I think when people actually dive into this stuff, they realize that there's a lot more nuance and there's a lot more sort of um, esoteria, if you will. Like like I remember years ago when I wrote 
for uh, West Coast reactionaries of, with Adam Wallace. We always had this saying, you know, um, hide your power levels through esoteria. Because the more people mm-hmm. are totally mind-fucked, the more that you can sort of slip things in through the back door. And, and I think that there's That's sort the of... the point of this podcast. That's why I don't explain shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But even, even like, you know, to me, I think Bronze Age Pervert, he doesn't come off as like, you know, a uh, quote-unquote racist white nationalist the way that... Um, a lot of like alt right 1.1 comes off as I think like there's there's a same with you know with uh, well it's because he's not Akon, it, right? he's it's not same... trying to be media media uh he's not he's not uh, outwardly facing so like yeah with the all right 1.1 like they they were they were clearly media focused right so you yes. get your Rick Spencer's and all these other LARPs right but like he's not his BAP and like a lot of these other people um are focused on their small niche community. And yes. that allows them to have more nuance. It also allows them to not fall into like trap, like, you know, media traps. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it does, it definitely has a different flavor to it and it has more value, I think, because of it. And, and I think that, um, but my critique, and I've, I've brought this up and break the rules. Um, my critique would be that um, having talked to him, you know, Having talked about, I think he, he gets this in terms of where I come from with um, my appreciation of quote unquote modern art. I think that, but the problem is that still we, ha- you know, the, the Baptists, they, they have to still expand their her- aesthetic horizons mm-hmm. beyond just physiques, right? Now, physiques are important. I think that um, this sort of unruly fugitive expression of a, a very ancient form of masculinity that is ripe with uh, aesthetic and spiritual possibilities but i think that it still needs to be brought to a coherence with artists and writers that are willing to take it a step further mm-hmm. like where is the, that. you know what i mean like where like there needs to be a a bap version of a zorbaran in visual art there needs to be a bapist version of a ernst younger Right there, there needs to mm-hmm. be these people. There needs to be a Baptist Yukio Mishima. There needs to be a Frog Twitter Yukio Mishima. There needs to be a Frog Twitter um, uh, Edvard Munch. Maybe I'm the Frog Twitter Edvard Munch. What am I talking mm-hmm. about? <laughs> uh, one person. Actually I mean, I feel said, like also yeah. it's also fairly early though. I think it's still possible. I mean, depending on yeah. how much steam this continues to have, like because yeah. again, it only came out two years ago, right? right. And if you got to consider that. Uh, Bronze I might say is only like two or so years old. It it already has a lot of uh, energy. So now what matters now is whether or not people take up the like do their part and like create works of art. Like I'm you know mm-hmm. and write books and the, the visual art aspect is also definitely missing. I know a lot of us write books are writers, but I don't mm-hmm. think that that. I mean most people don't read fundamentally, right? So <laughs> finding new ways yeah. like they just don't. And I think it's good that people don't read. I think they should continue to not read. It's not for them. When people read, they say dumb <laughs> shit. Right, people who yeah, are supposed to be reading already are. Um, that's mm-hmm. my opinion on the matter as a exactly. former teacher. But uh, well, then people but, uh, read bad you know. things. You have, like, like, look at like recently. I think you linked to this about these like women in MFA pro. I and again, I don't mean to be an anti woman, but these women in anti anti ugh. These women in MFA uh, programs. Not, this fucking New York. By the way, if you guys are pick hearing whatever loud shit is happening outside, it's New York City. I'm sorry. Yeah, don't. I, I don't hear anything. It's all right. But no, these these girls in these MFA programs that are talking about, you know, I don't want to read problematic bro. And this is like this woman with mm-hmm. the fucking hipster, the the art ho glasses, where it's like, got like a hundred thousand likes, and she's going through all the books, and she's like, yeah, I read Jane Austen, yeah, I read Twilight, and then it pops up um, Grapes of Wrath or something. It's like, oh, that's terrible. Are you kidding me? Then it's like at the end, it's like that one. Polonic book. What was it? Choke. It wasn't Fight Club. It was yeah, probably Choke yeah, or something. Choke like, or, oh my god, you fucking. Snuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be Snuff. Snuff's about pornography. Yeah, Snuff. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh my god, are you fucking kidding me? Like, to to me, I think that the again, this is again a a problem of elite overproduction. Other con, you know, another concept that I think that you write is getting woke on. Um, is the elite overproduction is really doing a disservice to the art world as well. And in the art mm-hmm. world is just as subject to this as well, because the art world and academia are like this, right, as everybody knows. So I, I think that the problem is that you're right, that people that need to read um, are doing it, because 
if if my work is being appreciated and read by high quality people, to me that get, you know mm -hmm. as much as I would love to have a very wide readership in terms of my articles, and hopefully I'll be coming out with a book within this year, maybe the end of the year or the next, right? If if my own laziness doesn't get the best of me, um, it will yeah, be a compilation of hard. essays. Yeah, yeah, but it will most likely be a compilation of essays on on art and aesthetics. Um, but you know, it, as much as it's good to have a wide readership, I feel that. It's true, but at the same time, this is why in my own work, I've tried to sort of wed what I'm painting and what I'm writing about at the same time. And I feel that to me, my works of art that can be explained coherently through through my ability to write, because you know, I went through academia and all that stuff, as people know. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I, I have a bit of an edge on other people. And I, I think like, a lot of artists that I know that I'm friends with, I think I could do them a great service by commenting on their art. Like, I, for example, a year or two ago, I wrote an article on School Shooter well, at Negative XP. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I want to do other things in the future with artists that I really admire and appreciate that I know personally. Um, but so the, the thing is, but to, to about that, you know, I'm just using the BAPIS as an example, but mm -hmm. what you brought, you know, what you've, uh, talked about about how it's only two years old and that i think this is um a real good test of the strength of discourse and community within the internet internet age itself because the problem is a lot of these movements they rely upon the attention economy and having quote-unquote steam and in their sales mm -hmm. right wind in their sales and so a lot of things like memes like meme plexes they, they don't have a very long shelf life because they always mm -hmm. get sort of taken over and they get conglomerated into other things and, and they run out of steam because of, you know, the same old infighting and shark wombing or people just simply lose interest or they, you know, the, the head figures at the top, they, they fundamentally, you know, fuck themselves over somehow and they become cringe and and you know cringe is the ever present enemy mm -hmm. you know like 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 uh, kurt's an apocalypse cringe now. Is the ever -present. yeah yeah like instead of horror it's cringe so cringe must be your friend it must be you know an ally or it's an enemy to be feared right so <laughs> there's only you can only find base by going through cringe there's only through cringe that base is present Exactly, exactly. You have to know the, you know, know the, the, the Dao De Ching, know the light but keep with the dark, know the cringe but keep to the base, right? Um, hey, so, so, fuck yeah. But, uh, uh, just be, this fucking music is getting even louder. But, uh, and also we're getting close to the end of the time. And, but, uh, mm. I do like, but that's, I think that is a, definitely a strong way to, you know, a strong message to leave with the audience. Yeah. And to know the cringe, but, uh, you formulated, how was you, how did you formulate that? Know the cringe, but keep to the based. Yeah. <laughs> know the cringe, but keep to the based. Um, so uh, is there any, um, I will link your, I'll put your links in the description, but is there anything else you want to like leave everyone with? Um, I, I guess my general message would always, um, is always sort of a form of sincerity, but even the word sincerity has mm -hmm. become uh, polluted over time. Uh, but, I think radical openness would be a better sort of expression of it. I think that, you know, as much as it's important to maintain a certain form of OPSEC, there, there still is potentials to be, um, there's a potentiality to being more honest and open and, and to sort of express oneself truly on the internet in these spheres than what is at present, you know, terminal irony mm. poisoning, you know, and I do my fair share of irony posting as well, but it's, but I think when it becomes the entirety of one's brand to become a certain pastiche, that should be avoided at all costs. And I recently wrote an, mm. an article in the American sun um, about mentorship and an e survival guide. I think everyone should highly look that one up. It's one of my most important works. I feel not to talk, not to blow smoke on my ass, but um, I mean, this is the, this is the time to blow smoke up your ass. Yeah, That's yeah. Good. So go to I'll the American ass, Sun. Like, yeah, go to the American Sun and um, look at that article. Uh, it's called uh, what's it called? Uh, to be open is to be, I think that's what it's called, but you'll know by the author nice. title. Um, yeah. Subscribe to this, subscribe to version, subscribe to verse saloon, but yeah, yeah. So and, uh, yeah, but be open and honest and, and try to, um, 
perfect a form of casual belligerence where when people mm. ask you what you believe, state what you believe no more, no less, and, and leave them, in, in some ways, leave them hanging because you always want to create a mystique while being open and honest at the same time, which is very difficult because a lot of people, they, they play into a certain caricature of what, um, you know, posting or even, you know, even in their ordinary lives, um, it can become very tempting to exist through a, a persona. But I think what you have to do is cultivate a personality where people that follow you or people that hang on your word, they are free and open to realize that you're more than what you're presenting at the given moment mm -hmm. because you can, you can never become uh, pigeonholed into a particular thing. And th because that's the death of creativity right there. And in terms of art and aesthetics, I think that in some ways we have to embrace a lot of the, the fugitive, evanescent, um, ever changing rhizom, you know, rhizomatic nature of aesthetics and content and art in the internet age being, um, what's the word, uh, netizens or netocrats. But at the mm, same netocrats, time, exactly. netocrats, yeah. But at the same time, I think we have to rein it in with truly trying to hammer out uh, great works that have consistency and longevity. And I think that we have I to agree. sort of you know, lift ourselves out of the impermanence, yet also use that impermanence as a tool. And this is very difficult, and I'm still struggling with this. And and so I think that's my, you know, my final message. No, I 100% <laughs> agree with this. This is also, uh, and again, just to stick with my, I'm a stand of Bard, and uh, his later books talked about this topic as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, using the, the impermanence uh, and using that as like stepping stones to create longevity. But um, the sense they're going to probably get me copyright trimmed by playing all of Ready to Die by Biggie in the background <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, there you go. I'm going to have to end it here. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you. I hope, talk to you. I hope to have you on in the future. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Hell, yeah. All right.